Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In this talk, I will describe my experiences with the study of mathematical economics as a graduate student at Stanford. So in a brilliant essay, Lai John Hoofwood has described the tribe of the econ and their peculiar customs and mores. What Lai John Hoofwood has not discussed is the amazing success and power of this tribe in leading the economic policies all over the world. This success depends on the performance of an amazing magic, uh, which I am about to expose in this art, in this talk. When I entered the graduate program in Stanford, it was clear that mathematical economics was the most prestigious and my own background in mathematics both suited me for this and also I enjoyed doing mathematics, so that's what I set out to do. But I became disillusioned with this discipline, and the goal of this talk is to explain why. In our first course on mathematical economics, our teacher Mordecai Kurtz described a game which was supposed to explain taxation. So the game he described was a purely artificial construct. They are uh, n players in the game and uh, each of them has a wealth endowment. Coalitions are allowed to form and any majority coalition uh, will um, set its own rules. This leads to a very simple and actually non-trivial kind of outcome because what happens is that the majority coalition will tax away everything that is owned by the minority and distribute everything equally among themselves. This leads to a very, um, very bland solution. Everyone ends up getting everything equal. The mathematics of this simple solution is quite complex. You have to basically take all possible coalitions which might form, uh, calculate how much a player gets in every one of these uh, enormous number of coalitions and then average over all these possible outcomes. While this makes a lot of sense uh, mathematically and is uh, rather difficult to do, uh, it just makes no sense at all from a real world perspective. The number that is assigned to the player uh, could not conceivably happen in any real world circumstance. So while the mathematics is interesting, uh, it has no relationship to reality. Uh, in the real world, majorities do not tax away all of the wealth of the minority. This game is just far too simple to represent the political process. And the method by which we find mathematical solutions, again, uh, this process which is assumed uh, to lead to the solution has no counterpart in reality. It seems clear to anyone with a little bit of common sense that if we want to study taxation and the tax rules and why they are like they are, we have to study the history of taxation. Uh, so there are a number of books and they explain how uh, the optics of ta taxation, uh, which is what the political parties say that they are doing, is always that we want to create equity and fairness, but the reality of how it happens is very different and so what ends up happening is very different from uh, the optics of it. In particular, for example, Reagan who championed low taxes was the president in which the highest tax uh, raises were passed. So it's quite complex uh, to study taxation. So I was flabbergasted to find that econ economics pays no attention at all to those real world uh, issues. And in fact, what Amon and Kurtz did in trying to solve the problem that this game was giving trivial solutions is that they said, okay, let's introduce an additional strategy which the minority players can use. And this strategy involves they are allowed to burn their endowments instead of going along with the proposal to tax everything away. So when you do this, this creates a threat against the majority and in the final solution to this new game with the burning threat, the majority does not tax everything away because uh, 
they are deterred by this threat. And so basically, you can say metaphorically that the majority passes tax laws which are not so harsh as to lead to rebellion, where by rebellion I mean that the minority prefers to burn their taxes instead of burn their endowments instead of giving them up in taxi. So this um, game again has no relationship to reality, but it produces uh, outcomes, tax laws which have some some sense, some resemblance to what one might see in the real world. So as long as economists can find their results to reality, oh, look, here's a mathematical model and here's the solution. There's no objection to playing games with mathematics. I enjoyed doing that a lot myself. But when you start to go from a, a children's game to real war and you say you draw conclusions from one about the other, then um, there's something really wrong going on. So. In fact, in the article published, uh, Aman and Kurtz do draw conclusions about the real world. They say that this coalition game in which the majority can do anything is like democracy, which it is not because uh, in a democracy, one particular coalition forms. And in this game, they allow all possible coalitions to form. And the idea that the minority can burn their endowment, they liken to farmers' rebellions in which they sometimes used to burn their crops to prevent their expropriation. Now, this is a window dressing because the reality of farmers' rebellions is far more complex than anything that can be captured in a game this simple. Uh, but unfortunately, economists have nothing but disdain for history and politics. They think that these are just words without models and therefore they, are, they don't convey any knowledge and as a result economists are completely ignore, ignorant about the real world aspects of taxation. So the conclusion they draw from this simple toy model in the leading econometric journal Econ, uh, Econometrica is that our model shows that democracy is superior to concentration of power because their tax laws are more uh, plausible than uh, those that would arise in a autocratic uh, society. So on the one hand, this is completely trite and meaningless. Obviously, in any game that you create, any artificial game, if you say that if you represent power in that game in any suitable way, and giving power to a small number will end up with their having more wealth. Otherwise, you haven't captured power and wealth correctly. So you can create a thousand different games with this, uh, with, with vastly different details, and they will all lead to this same result. So uh, at the same time, this conclusion is actually false if you study history. If you look at communist countries where there's a lot of concentration of power, they, they used to have in the communist era, a very equitable distribution of help compared to capitalist democracies. And it's only after they transitioned from communism to capitalism that their uh, wealth distribution became highly unequal. But such problems don't even occur to economists who are completely ignorant of the tax uh, history and the books that I mentioned. They neither read them nor do they suggest that we read something because they don't think that those books carry any understanding of uh, economics. So this is flabbergasting. How can any sane person think that we can derive results about US tax policy by looking at this artificial game and this artificial mathematical process? And this is exactly uh, lesson was confirmed later that we only studied mathematics, very abstract and very artificial mathematics. And we use this mathematics to draw conclusions about reality, which we had no knowledge of whatsoever. So this leads to the bigger puzzle, which I have been concerned with ever since uh, my graduate days, is how do economists perform this magic? They take these completely silly models and they start believing it 
in in them themselves they think that these models have something to do with reality well that's delusional but then they convince students into believing this uh, delusional uh, approach to reality and they convince the whole world to follow policies built upon these delusional models so this is an amazing trick i mean if anybody can do this uh, more power to them and then the issue is we need to learn how this trick is performed maybe we can convince people that there are um, fairies who will leave us uh, fortunes when we um, sleep So coming back to my life experiences, uh, although I had intended to go into mathematical economics, I found it just unbelievably um, strange. And so I switched to econometrics, which I thought was more anchored to reality because it did real data analysis. Much later, I discovered that econometrics was also a con game. Uh, although we do, do deal with real data, we make such fake and artificial assumptions in order to analyze them that the end result has nothing to do with the data and everything to do with what we hypothesize in advance that the data should be telling us. In terms of the follow-up, which I plan to do later, we will see that central models of economics, the model used for macro policy making, macroeconomic policy making all over the world, is the DSG model in which there is only one agent who is infinitely lived and has perfect foresight. He knows everything that's going to happen in the future in every single period and he maximizes his utility over all of these infinite periods. So Sargent um, uh, solo commenting on the failure of the macroeconomic policies in the up after the global financial crisis commented that the cause was these models because an agent can't deceive himself. A single agent cannot deceive himself and the financial crisis was caused by a lot of fraud and deception. So um, the larger picture is how can uh, economists build completely crazy models and then expect them to work, expect them to describe reality, expect them to uh, be useful for policy making. This puzzle I will turn to in later portions of this talk.